So, our next speaker is Professor Eva Tardosh. Eva is a professor of computer science at Cornell University. Uh, she has made tremendous contribution to the area of algorithm design and analysis and combinatorial optimization. She is also one of the founders of an area that is dear to my heart, uh, algorithmic game theory, which combines algorithms and game theory and now also learning. Um, She's a member of many academies. I think the Israeli one is maybe <laughs> the only one she's not. So she's a member of, um, wait, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. She received many prestigious prizes and awards over the years, including the Gedel Prize. She's not one of the 17 uh, Israelis, but she has won it. Yeah, yeah, we, we are here on conversion, many conversion missions. <laughs> um, and most recently, the IEEE for Newman Medal in 2019, just now. And, um, right, on a personal level, I should say that Eva has been uh, a great inspiration for me since the time of my PhD studies, which unfortunately means for a long time. As uh, Sarit started her talk by saying, people get old. <laughs> So thank you, Eva. So I want to talk about learning, and hence the title seems to like relate to the previous talk. But in reality, it won't actually do that because uh, of the context in which uh, I want to want robots or someone to learn. Uh, learning is a very algorithmic task, and we kind of know how to do this, or at least we know. Uh, I guess I'm in the <laughs> sort of norms model of how to think about life, I think in some way this talk maybe at the moment is closer to understanding how a system works or trying to develop models that helps us understanding what's really happening rather than um, what the previous talk was about is an engineering task of helping robots learn how to do something well. Um, so I guess the way I'm thinking about uh, learning and I guess game theory, which was where I came from, is interactions that happen through the computer that very many people are, or very many algorithmic decision makers are involved, and they're trying to make algorithmic decisions. I guess my sort of go-to examples are either packet routing or, or, uh, or um, internet auction. And the question I have been working on for now, actually, uh, very many years, which probably I should not name anymore, but will come out, is what are systems where uh, what happens in a, in a multi-agent multi interaction, there is a so-called tragedy of the commons where uh, this, they're due to the selfish behavior of the participant, it sort of ruins the possible social welfare, such as the classical tragedy of the commons example where apparently participants are induced to put too many casts on this patch to, um, to um, take the value of, of what was possible with fewer things. And again, my go-to examples are either packet routing or if you want actually car routing maybe also uh, and, and internet, internet auctions. Um, what I'm going to think about as a modeling task here is that as a packet router or as a, even as an advertiser, uh, I'm not going to model your behavior as specifically you want to get other packets to not get to their destination, rather that you selfishly and simplistically want to just optimize for yourself. This is definitely, I think, a good model of packet routing. Uh, or, or what the routers do in, in a package routing system, and maybe a decent model in, of internet advertisement as long as it's a big enough system with enough participants that particularly ruining one other guy is not going to be all that helpful. Um, and one important feature of the applications I'm going to want to think about is applications like this too, which have the property that um, I'm not training someone to do something right, rather I'm training them while they're doing the thing, which I guess is possible in settings where uh, the repeated actions are of practically no value. That is, losing a single packet is not that important, uh, and definitely the value of a single advertisement is, is essentially 
uh, fractions of a cent, so not important. And the value of the system is in the overall performance. It's like if, if I lost something because of a training mistake, that's fine, no big deal. We can resend the packet or it's just one edit, no one cares. But yet, somehow, you know, we live on the internet economy or we live on both in, in that sense and also in the package writing sense. This is something that uh, the overall performance is very important for us. Now, I don't know how much I need to illustrate in, in an example, and I only put in one example, and actually not the auction example, but the package writing example, just to tell you what the model is, and maybe all of you uh, know this or would have Im imagined this. So I imagine there is a bunch of packets that one will all get from S to T, uh, and then maybe different links or different uh, routers in the system have different performance measures or performance abilities. Uh, a simple model here is that the delay or the time it takes to get across is a function of how many packets are going, the function of the congestion. So in this super simple example, this gets a linear delay and this, this is a constant, uh, takes one unit of time no matter what. And if you have one unit of, of, of traffic, then I guess in this particular solution, the upper link is going to cost you um, half a unit of time and lower link uh, will take one unit of time. And I guess I originally was looking at Nash equilibrium or stable solutions, and this is not the stable solution, uh, as in the upper link is, is faster. So uh, the natural solution is that everyone switches to that upper link. And as a result, um, everyone is, turns out, equally unhappy. So this is sort of a classical example of uh, what Nash equilibrium or what game theory will predict. Um, similar things in a more general model, I can generalize this and maybe that's a good example to have in mind, though I guess that's certainly not the only example where what I want to tell you about learning will apply. Uh, so the general model would be there is a bigger network, every edge has a, has a delay function or a cost function of what does it cost to get across, which is uh, um, a function of um, you know, what the traffic is on that edge. Uh, you imagine these functions are monotone decreasing. If I want to model capacities, I put in a function of this form. That is, it goes to infinity as the, as the traffic goes closer to the capacity. Um, and I guess every, um, the users have a source sync power and they want to send packets from the source to sync. Um, and I guess a single user will selfishly optimize getting his packet as fast across as possible. Um, and that will be his objective function. And the, the way I want to think about the value of the system or social welfare is simply summing, up, summing this up over all packets. So again, this is just one example of package routing with delays. It's an example I personally like, but you know, other examples where the same machinery or same uh, system will apply, and maybe that's also good or maybe even better for actually getting data is advertisement auction. Same sort of system, a little bit different, and I didn't want to include both examples uh, with the details. So uh, what we have been, we is a large community. Many of you, some of you are present, some of you other is like a lot of them from Israel and other places uh, worked on, um, you know, understanding what Nash equilibrium is. And remember Nash equilibrium is a solution like what I showed where uh, the current solution is such that it's the best response for every single player. It's nice because Nash proved it exists. Actually, in the concrete application, Beckman proved it um, some nice properties. Uh, and then we have been working in this concept of price of energy, and this is a key concept of what I still want to think about, the cost of what happens when people selfishly, uh, selfishly optimize versus the optimal outcome. And just to sort of finish and actually even put a date to the old story, I guess one of the early papers that uh, Mihal also mentioned is this price of energy paper, which says that in this traffic routing contest, you have actually a nice and not so damaging upper bound that yes, as we have seen way back in the example, centrally arranged optimum could be better than what selfish people observe, but it's not insanely worse, no matter what the cost function are, and this is one particular way to express it. I guess it says that if you design the network so it's capable of carrying twice the traffic you actually have, then a Nash equilibrium will do okay. 
Okay, centrally designed optimum could do even better, but the selfish optimum will do okay. So that's, you know, after or on the, in line with this, and since then, there are about a million papers and it flourished into a beautiful area with lots and lots of papers in a lot of different contexts. I listed some of them, definitely not all. And the whole point of this list was just to give you that there's lots of these, these results out there from traffic routing that I studied, facility location, bandwidth sharing, uh, lots and lots of auction variants like first price and second price, variational mechanisms and lots of other ones uh, all have CRMs of this form. I guess this slide actually was a bit skimping on not telling you what the price of energy factors are, but every one of them is giving you a constant, you know, like two, one and a half, one point something, not a horribly big constant. For a theoretician like me, these are actually small, nice, friendly constants. Uh, what I want to get to, and that's sort of the, talk of, or the topic what I really want to talk about, is uh, actually criticizing this and trying to think of what we can do in systems such as actually these applications uh, when I don't like Nash equilibrium. So why wouldn't I like Nash equilibrium? Uh, you know, it depends uh, your background. I don't like Nash equilibrium because it's hard for these automats to find the Nash equilibrium. And I mean, um, you know, there are many, many reasons, one of which is there are multiple Nashes in many games. How did they know which one they're supposed to coordinate on? Uh, my favorite one is there way too much information needed here. So the games that computer scientists like thinking about, such as package routing, every router is a participant. There are a million participants out there. It's very hard to, for any router to know which other routers have packets, which are down, which are up what would be in the Nash equilibrium here. So the information need is insane. And then there is, of course, the computational difficulty. That is, finding Nash equilibrium is computationally hard, so it's not going to work. So instead, I want to propose that we have some repeated game model that is uh, in these settings, and packet routing is definitely one of them, as is ad auction. We actually rat over and over again, and, and you know, the router can learn from the experience. So this is something that in your application we really can't do. We don't want the, you know, home, home robot to drop the person a couple of times and then learn from that experience. But we can do it in packet routing because dropping packets is not all that painful. So, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, play it for a while, eventually uh, you're going to do, in, maybe in the beginning you don't know what's going on, but eventually, uh, you want to hope to do better. So learning has a very long history, uh, and despite my age and what uh, uh, Michal implicitly said about it, starting before I was born. Uh, so Julia Robinson proved that in some games, fictitious play, or proof things about some games, one particular learning algorithm, fictitious play. Uh, I guess what I more want to emphasize, rather than defining fictitious play, uh, is the goal that these people had in mind. So they more had it as a, actually more applied to your setting. We're going to do this learning algorithm to have them practice, to hope that they find the Nash equilibrium. And in my applications, this would be kind of cool because we can say positive things about Nash. So therefore, if they could find the Nash, that would be nice. Now, today we, lo we, we kind of know that this isn't going to work out for them because of the computational difficulty. This is an algorithm. And since, algorithm, since there's computational difficulty in finding Nash, it can't possibly work. And indeed, it's not working or rarely working. What Robinson proved is two-person zero-sum games. It's actually working. It's finding a Nash. There are a couple other examples. I guess maybe uh, two others, uh, maybe a bit more recent, I listed here. But mostly the message is that this tends not to work. Um, now, what would it mean that they, a learning algorithm finds a Nash? And that's what the picture above trying to suggest. It, it wants to suggest something that there is a learning part, there is a black part when they're trying to get the right solution, and eventually they lock into something that looks like a stable outcome. And I don't literally mean what I had on the slide, maybe what I really mean is they get closer and closer to it, like the changes are very minimal and they kind of, they learned it. They're pretty damn close to it. So here is where I admit that I have data or have some data on adductions and I don't actually have data on how 
routers learn. But one thing we can learn from ad auctions that the outcome is not stable. And there might be many reasons why it's not stable. This is a Microsoft Bing auction. That is, Bing is the search engine. And Bing, uh, like Google also, is running an auction to monetize it. And this is data from there as people are bidding. And what we see here is that a couple of these guys are kind of stable down here, but a whole bunch of them are not. This is one particular keyword. I guess this is another keyword. Uh, I have, like, I don't know, many of these. And none of, not a single one of them is stable. And actually, you can't be too surprised because we know there is a whole industry that's trying to help this learning algorithm. It was so stable, maybe you didn't need that industry. And what that industry is trying to do is run basically some sort of learning algorithms to figure out what to bid and modify the bits so that it keeps being close to optimal. So uh, what Kim, and this is still already relatively older uh, work, is instead of uh, thinking about finding a Nash, I want to have a sort of change of focus and want to think about uh, what's it like to think about learning while playing. And for this, I want to remind you what does it mean to be Nash equilibrium in this sort of going back to the Nash version when they converge to something. So we said that this thing is Nash and introducing some notation if the cost that a particular player I is playing is no uh, worse than or no better or yeah is less than or equal to the cost any other strategy would have cost him. That is the definition of what it means to be a Nash equilibrium. And we call this the no regret condition. And what I want to propose or have been working on for a while is um, no regret condition without the stability. So without the stability, I want exactly the same condition. So going back to the previous slide, the condition was that you not regretting not having played this alternate strategy SI star. I propose that we might want to consider exactly that condition or something like that condition, except without the stability. And what I mean here is you should do at least as well that any single strategy SI prime in hindsight. That is, um, not considering um, that you could have kept changing your strategy, at least do it as well as a single best strategy would have done with hindsight. Um, oops, single best strategy. So I want to spend a couple minutes in sort of telling you both why this is good and also why this is not good, which will then, I hope, for those of you who have seen talks with this kind of learning and games, uh, I think tell you some open directions that I think would be really interesting to get better results on. And if you haven't seen so many talks or not so comfortable with, then it will, should tell you the pluses or minuses why this is a good or bad model of learning. So again, I wrote the condition back, is the cost that one player is playing is no worse than um, a single strategy with hindsight. So I like it as a behavior model. Um, it says something super simple is that if there is a consistently good strategy that's consistently go over time, please wake up to this. So if I want to model people are driving you know, to work from somewhere in the distance, you know, if sometimes this highway is good and sometimes that highway is good, it, that's hard. But there's a consistently good answer, please wake up to that and drive on that one. It seems like a simple requirement. Um, it's also good to know that there are simple algorithms that do this. And in fact, I don't need common, don't need, don't need know who's driving. I just need to try. I, I learn it while I, while I'm doing it. Uh, there are very natural, simple algorithms that take care of this. Um, and of course, um, I like it because it's a very nice inequality. I can do maths with it. It's a condition that's nice to use. Uh, for someone who wants to have a mathematical condition. There are a bunch of sort of both human subject and data-based experience uh, with this, uh, starting from um, old experiences in the 90s, um, including uh, you know, our paper that I took the data from, which is this one, the Bing data, which I showed you one slide, and I'll show you one in, another one in a second, including a uh, human subject experiment that not the end and Noam did, uh, that all somewhat supportive. 
uh, and somewhat not supportive. This is not a perfect model of either human behavior or the ratter's behavior, but it's a decent model. Um, so if I want to go back to our, our advertisement auction model, here is um, the regret model. That is, this is how much regret is left in uh, advertising auction. And I guess, uh, so these are advertisers, one who advertise for a particular keyword, and they're trying to bid to optimize their value. Um, you know, 30% of them literally have no regret. That's cool. A whole bunch of them have regret. I'm happy to quantify these guys in the, you know, 10, 15% regret that that's not too bad. And that's the only, only sense in which I'm claiming this is a decent model. They will have some regret left. It's not perfect. Um, I don't find this as the most damaging uh, uh, reasoning around the model. There's a little bit of regret left over. There's good reasons that people don't pay that much attention to it. But I want to actually have a, before I tell you what I and we can as a community or I more recently have done that we can use this model, I want to also spend a slide on what are the limitations and what I think I wish I could do better. So there, this is again, the model is back. Here are the limitations. Um, it works reasonably well in setups where the thing I want to learn is sufficiently low dimensional. There are few decisions to be made. It even works on traffic writing, which, you know, there might be exponentially many paths, but luckily it's at least low dimensional. The number of edges is low, and that is helpful. Works really, really badly, as in not at all, as in proven by white papers, the kind of setup that Noam was talking about, multi-item auction. Multi-item auction, as Noam well explained people valuation, there is an insanely complicated valuation space. And learning in that space is very complicated, as proven by this paper. So uh, while I said learning is easy, what I meant is learning is easy if the decision space is not too complicated. And um, so maybe it's not so easy. Uh, second, and this is actually a, a sort of interesting constructive point, uh, there are now this couple of papers that are trying to tell you how should you play if you know your opponent is running an no-regret learning algorithm. And both papers kind of claim that, wow, you can take advantage of that dumb opponent. If you know what he's doing, that's always helpful. So that it is, it, it is, you know, it's an interesting question of what would be a, learning alg a variant on this learning algorithm that's still reasonable to learn and doesn't offer the seller or someone an uh, uh, insane advantage to take advantage of you. Um, I'm hoping that we can expect more of people and the two categories, one I will talk about in a second, and the second that I want to emphasize and at the moment can't say anything about. Um, these learning algorithms that I'm so far talking about will lead you to, to a Nash equilibrium. In games where Nash equilibrium is dangerously bad or can be bad, one wish that learning can do better. And why might I hope that learning can do better is because one thing these learning algorithms don't take into account is the anticipation that if I behave somehow, the opponent will react to this. If I take learning algorithms that do take this into account, and there are a couple learning algorithms of that form around, I was hoping that will actually better things will happen in games. Uh, at the moment, I guess I don't. I, this paper so explained to us what happens in two-person repeated prisoner dilemma. So indeed, it, good things happen in that particular game, but they are just more an example of a game rather than a class of games where they can say positive things. Um, so I told you about the price of energy, and I guess, uh, uh, which was again the ratio of how much a Nash equilibrium cost versus the optimum cost. Uh, this has been extended in a sequence of paper with a beautiful uh, framework of Tim Ravgarden from now 10 years ago to learning outcomes. Uh, however, one further restriction, which is definitely not true in either the package writing life or in, in, uh, in uh, uh, ad auctions, is the assumption was that the literally the same game, the literally the same players repeat over and over again. Why is that not true? In packet writing, once I start 
stop reading the New York Times, so I guess I'm not downloading packets from the New York Times. And the same applies to the rest of us. So there is a sort of changeover of participation. The same applies to car traffic once, you know, traffic changes over time. Uh, and definitely also applies on ad auctions, things change, like something becomes popular, a new advertiser shows up, things are varying uh, all the time. So I guess the uh, extension of the result I want to talk about, which is joint with, uh, at this point, two of my ex-students, both of which now working for Microsoft instead, uh, Vasily Sirkanis and, and Todoris Likaris, uh, is a version, extension of this, uh, when not only we are repeating the game, but participants come and go. And I claim that learning actually can do something, or learning while playing can do something, that Nash Equilibrium actually couldn't. It allows the players to adjust to the situation. That's what learning is supposed to be good for. If I'm learning while playing, then if the situation changes, I will wake up to it and learn. Uh, humans do do that. Uh, so, um, I guess um, to tell you, so this is sort of the goal of something I want to tell you about. It will come with some uh, framework of what, uh, what one needs, what, one, what, what I mean by learning and what, what do I need from the learners. Um, to tell you about this, I actually have to tell you a little bit more of how these price of energy results on the top two lines were proven. Uh, you know, I definitely don't want this to uh, be or shouldn't have been a very mathematical talk, but I think these proof outlines have a very simple, elegant message that hopefully is worth uh, repeating. So this is the team's framework that he summarized uh, why these results extend to, um, to um, learning outcomes. And that was this very simple observation that what we're using in this proof is actually not as much, and this is going to be the price of energy, uh, price of energy proof, not as much something complicated about what Nash equilibrium is like, simply the fact that no player regrets not playing the optimum. So if I know what uh, the optimum should be, so this is what the optimum strategy, the optimum asked him to do, then the only inequality I'm using in the proof is that he's not regretting not doing that. Um, and then he observed that most of our proofs look like a funny inequality, and then putting this together with that condition will give us the Nash equilibrium. Um, so before I continue, maybe I want to spend one, even though I want to prove that this kind of inequality could be true, I want to give you a one second idea of, yeah, of course, if this inequality is true, then good things should happen, which is sort of easy to see. So what does this inequality say in written out in plain English. I think the right way to think about it is that on the upper side, there are two things, the optimum with a multiplier and the current cost with a multiplier less than one. So if it were to, to be the case that the optimum is much, much, much cheaper than our current solution. So imagine the optimum is, is, is very cheap compared to our current cost, which is insanely high. In that case, because I have a mu here that's below one, uh, the summation will still be below the current cost. And that means the inequality says that one of these guys, on, aver on average, the sum of these guys is less than the cost, this cost, and therefore one of them should prefer moving to the optimum. So this is a very simple inequality that clearly, and indeed a one-line proof given this, to prove that this is a Nash equilibrium because of the Nash condition. We know that none of them want to move to the optimum, so their current cost is less, and simply rearrange inequality, and we get the optimum cost. Now, without giving you a single example of why this happened, in both in traffic routing and all these other uh, applications, turns out if you work out what's the best new in lambda, it gives you the tight band, that this is just the truth. It's not just a simple framework, but it turns out that you get very, the strongest results possible. So this is the framework, and why is this a nice framework? It's a nice framework because I didn't actually use uh, anything about that it was a stable outcome. I used one inequality. I've used that he's not regretting the optimum. And this literally what I assumed when I said that there are no regret learners 
they're not regretting anything. One important fact is, of course, they don't have to know what the optimum is because they're not regretting anything in particular. They're not regretting whatever the optimum might have been. So here is what I'm hoping to try to convince you that we can prove, and that maybe is an interesting uh, statement. Here's the actual model. So take one of these games that we have a price of energy proof for, and change the game, the way the game is played by changing the population. That is, by making the population dynamic, as we called it. That is, um, every iteration, every, some of the players come and go. Like some vanish, some stay. The concrete model we're using is that we do this at random. Every person that vanishes with some probability p, and some worst case other guy shows up. But you can actually, it's pretty flexible of what the model is. I don't want this probability to be super high. That is, if every iteration, literally a whole bunch of other guys showed up, then of course you can't possibly learn, because people don't stay long enough to learn. Uh, at the same time, I'm going to think of this p as you know, close to a cost to a constant or maybe log something, it's pretty, like, lots and lots of things changing all the time. Um, so before I can tell you what we can do, I should ask you, should, or ask ourselves, is no regret condition that I literally wrote, wrote down, that is the cost of every player is less than the cost of a single strategy with hindsight, um, that's a little too weak. And I guess, what way do I think it's too weak? It's not modeling what I said in English. What I said in English is that learning is good because players can adjust to changing situations. And that's not what's written here. It lets learning recognizes if something is consistently good, changing or not. And in particular, of course, my example shows this. So in, say, a package routing example, this red guy, when he shows up, you know, the upper rat is super congested, and so he knows to choose the lower rat. But, you know, as he stays around, things change. The upper pies guys, for some reason, all vanish, and his lower guys show, in, show up instead, then uh, he's going to have to know to adjust and switch his packets to the upper rat, which is better. So I need a model in which uh, people um, or the learners will be capable of learning that they need to change. And the actual version of learning we're using, and here is a lot more complicated inequality actually coming from a different paper of ours, um, is something like the previous one. And let me try to go through the inequality. So first of all, I put in a funny thing about the, who the players are, like the evaluation or the desires, because with the changing population, I have to remember who is player I. So that's just a slight notation change. Second, maybe reacting to reality that people weren't actually learning to be perfect, I put in an error parameter. Remember from the Microsoft data, I should, should think of epsilon as 10%. That's roughly what the error most of them are having. So you can think of epsilon as a decently small constant here. Um, and then second, I said that not just a single strategy with hindsight, and this is the key message, not just a single strategy with hindsight, but a sequence of changing strategies. But please don't change a lot. Namely, if you're going to have to change my strategy every single iteration, then God knows what I'm going to learn from. But if I have to change it just once or twice, maybe I can adjust. That is what learning is supposed to be doing good for. And technically, I guess the error, there is some number of changes, and the error will increase with the number of changes. This is not too surprising. Uh, what's interesting here is, of course, I'm not going to inform him when he has to change. right? We don't warn people that, hey, 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 notice, wake up. You need to restart your learning algorithm. Yet, there is something here that they can learn. A very simple algorithm can learn uh, with minimal set of changes. Maybe worth telling you one sentence of how do I have to change classical learning algorithms to achieve this. Uh, and that's what's written on the bottom here. I have to do something that humans do by nature, uh, namely inject a bit of recency bias. Why would you want recency bias in this particular application? Is because whatever happened yesterday is so much more relevant than whatever happened a month ago. Uh, I'm changing the population. Whoever was there yesterday probably is still there, so I better pay attention to him. Whoever was there a month ago might have easily gone home. 
that's not so relevant. So all I have to do is just discount the past a bit. It's less, less relevant. Um, in fact, one of the early uh, human subject experiment papers uh, that I showed you with that said I had data that people are learning, uh, Fudenberg paper, actually, uh, the top of the paper says people are not learning because they're recency biased. And I guess I took home the message from them, and which supported by data. Yes, they're learning. They're just learning with a bit of recency bias, which is maybe not perfect for learning, but it's definitely perfect for many applications, or good for many applications. So if I want to adopt the proof, what I would have wanted, and this is maybe will turn out to be a too much. Remember, what we wanted is wanted people not to regret whatever the optimum did. And if I could do that, then I can just go adopt the old proof uh, as, as it was. The slight trouble in our life is that wanting them to not regret what the optimum does is too much. Like the optimum is a super sensitive object, um, like in a sort of say matching application. Uh, here is a maybe optimal matching. One guy goes home and the whole matching changes. Um, thank you. Um, so I guess technically there are two sort of beyond the framework. There's two mathematical thing I, I'm going. We going. We had to prove to prove that this kind of thing is possible. I had to argue that there is a in in all of these applications there is a close to optimal solution that's super stable that is learnable. And I guess, uh, roughly speaking, this, or, or at the high level of speaking, but the theorem says that in any application where I have a price of energy band, if I also have a close to optimal solution, which instead of S star, I call it S tilde star, which has the property that for any one player, the number of changes is no more than some k, then I can have them learn it and get a price of energy band that's super close to whatever the previous optimum was. Um, so I guess maybe I'm going to, uh, without telling you too much detail of how, I, how we go about proving this, I can maybe tell you one application of what kind of results we're getting. Uh, at the high level, uh, the bands we're getting is a product of three different things, which I call here alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha is the original price of energy band. If the player start off in a Nash, it's not going to change, so I can't, can't actually do better than that band and this particular proof style. Uh, second, uh, there's a little bit of loss due to regret error. They're not perfectly learning, and therefore, there's a little bit of extra loss there. That's the gamma number. And finally, there is the beta. They can only track a solution that's not so changeable. They can't track the true optimum, so whatever I lost there. Uh, I'm going to lose that too. Uh, it's kind of interesting that all of these bands, are, or the price of energy is unfortunately what it is, uh, but the two other ones, as the changeover is, is less, and less, less and less frequent, it's going to one that is. Regret error, if they stay long enough in a game, they can learn. Regret error will go to zero. And in large games, this not allowing the change will also actually, you don't have to lose too much. Um, um, I actually had slides on something about the proof technique, but probably I'm going to ask, or best that I skip that, and instead try to tell you what my sort of main conclusion and message here is. Uh, a little bit going to, a little bit going, summarizing what, I, what we can prove, and a little bit going back to that slide where I criticized the limitation of no regret learning and trying to suggest that there are really cool questions here of how, can, how we can do better. So, I like learning in games in English for things I said in English, some of which I can prove and some of which I can only say in English. Uh, it's something that needs no prior, which is great in, great in large games where you don't even know who the opponents are. Um, but it's also good because learning can take advantage of when the, when the opponent's playing badly. So when I teach learning in a class, I often actually try to play, get a volunteer from the class, and make them play rock, paper, scissor against me, and I play badly on purpose, and sort of wake how fast the human wakes up that I'm doing something dumb and they should beat me. Uh, and they do, people do. But at the moment, I don't have any particular model, uh, uh, particular results where I can sort of prove that learning has an advantage. And I think the setup we have is ideal to actually have such results. I just, at the moment, can't prove it. Uh, namely, uh, I have 
a game where the population is changing. Uh, ideally, it should be the case that people who have been in the game longer should be doing better on average. It ought to be true. It's probably true when we simulate it. I don't know if it's true in the worst case. Um, but I did prove that on, at least as far as overall welfare goes, uh, learners can do well in dynamic environments, even when, that, when the environment is changing quite frequently. But I did leave open a lot of questions. I think there are a bunch of games where learning should be able to do much, much better than the price of energy. Uh, this is especially true if you adopt the kind of learning algorithms, which are variations on no regret learning, which try to anticipate how or watch how people react to your, your, your behavior. Um, so like, for example, policy regret. Um, and I think one question that I currently find very exciting uh, is the last one listed here is uh, one other sort of maybe interesting or not so fair assumptions that all our results do so far is assume that the iterations of the game are separate independent iterations. This is, I think, a perfect model of morning rush hour traffic in any place where there is a morning rush hour. However bad the rush hour was on Monday, those cars are not there Tuesday morning. Somehow they managed to get home. It's not a perfect model for either of my two applications. Uh, in the package routing version, uh, if there is a traffic jam of packets, then we're going to have to clear it, and that ruins the next iteration, also there are extra packets there. And in the context of ad auctions, uh, the advertisers usually have budgets. If you succeeded in buying something, you have less money. If you failed at buying something, you have more money. And this leftover budget is not getting mulled here at the moment in these results. But I'm going to thank you for your attention, and uh, thanks for staying. So <clears throat> when you start learning economics, you, the first thing you learn are the two welfare theorems that tell you that the market is in equilibrium. So if we go back to the, to the computational lens on this, the answer is no, probably not, because it takes too long to get equilibrium. And if you go there, it's probably a terrible equilibrium. So it should not be called the welfare theorem. It should be called something else. So I disagree, actually, of that conclusion. So uh, what's your take on it? In these setups, I think the market is not equilibrium because of what I'm trying to model here. Uh, these markets or these setups are so changeable. No, no, I'm even looking, that, I'm looking at the classical yeah, set. Let me get the to that. Oh, so changeable that it can't equilibrate because of lack of information. By the time you wake up to, you know, who went home and who stayed, some other people went home and other people stayed, and just it's too changeable. And we are actually working on the Microsoft data set. I want to prove that the variation, the, the reason they don't equilibrate is this. It's not because they're bad at learning, but instead because things keep changing. Um, you know, it, it, it's non-trivial to, to get, extract this from data, but I think we, we're almost there. I think the reason things are changing, the reason things are not equilibrated is not because they failed to, failed to find the equilibrium via learning, but because things are too changeable, they can't do it. No, but this, uh, in yeah. a stable market, um, I actually more on the economist side that there seems to be some sense in which equilibrium does appear to arise. And I want to uh, sort of respond with the question I asked Noam, that yes, in the worst case, finding Nash equilibrium is computationally hard. Yet, somehow, some things find it. And we just don't seem to have the right model of which way the markets that we observe are pretty stable, which some are. Uh, are, are simple. I would like to have a nice mathematical model that explains what's the reason that it's not as complicated as the worst case theorem uh, would, prove, would make it seem. I mean, to you know, respond as a true detail-oriented answer, if you look into the PPAD proof, that, those are very crazy games. Not, or, or PPAD proof, that's market equilibrium. Those are very crazy markets. Those are not what the real markets are like. So I'm not. You know, I think the problem in, in many real applications is it's not stable enough to equilibrate. It, it would take a while, and it's not happening because it just takes too long. It's too changeable.